Hello and uh, welcome to the sixth complete uh, webinar with myself, Katie Ledger and Dr. Alan Watkins. Um, we're going to be talking this week about will anything change? Um, what I'd really like you to do, invite you to do is put questions in the Q&A box or in the chat box, doesn't really matter. Um, one thing I would ask though, if you put it in the chat box, um, just to make sure that other participants can see it as well as um, us panelists so that uh, people can see what the debate is, is all about. Um, this is just a warning, it is quite a big topic that we're going to be covering today. So um, it, it may be that we, we cover it all in this session or we may actually put on another session if, uh, if there's enough questions and enough people are, are interested. Um, so Alan, uh, welcome, good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Katie. It is a big topic uh, and there's been much talk about, about change, but you know, will anything actually change? Well, uh, it's a great question, of course, and um, the simple answer is if enough people don't commit to that change, then nothing will change. Um, but before we get into the details of the change, um, there's a sort of list of the sort of why, when, what, where, who and how uh, of change. So I think it's pretty self-evident that we have to change. Um, we can't continue uh, the way that we have been. So I think that's, for that question, it's a bit of a do. Um, <laughs> but the when of change, um, well, my view is now, uh, why wait? Um, and what needs to change? Well, I need to change. We need to change. It needs to change. So all of that. So as we've discussed in previous uh, webinars and podcasts, I, we, and it, all dimensions of our experience. So we need to think about changing in all those dimensions. And where in the world does that change need to happen? Pretty much everywhere. We live in a global economy. We live, uh, you know, the pandemic is global. So it's not like one part of the world needs to change, another part of the world doesn't. Uh, I think that's pretty much everywhere. The good news is it only really requires 10% people to really commit to the change for the change to start to happen. That's the sort of tipping point doesn't require everybody uh, to change, just 10%. And what we're going to get into today is the 12 steps, the, the how of change. Like, how do you do that? So if we agree that we need to change and that has, needs to happen now in all aspects of our lives everywhere, and enough of us need to, then we're into the real question of today, which is how do you actually do that? Can I ask a quick question, Alan? Sure. About the, the 10%. What's so special about the, the, the 10%? It's the sort of, you know, um, tipping point, the, the avalanche. Um, uh, and we'll get to hopefully a little bit later how human beings, ironically, given the fact we're in a very changeable world, are pretty change resistant. Now, that's one of the, the things that's made us a, a very dominant species is we can stabilize and keep things uh, fairly steady and stable. Uh, and, and we've done very well under those cushions, but we're fairly resistant to change. and We'll get into that. Um, and um, I think if enough 10% commit, then that creates critical momentum to drive the change of the entire system. Okay. So hopefully that's optimistic. Yeah, we don't, we don't need everybody in the company or everybody in the organization or everybody in the nation to change. We just have to create the momentum and then the momentum then drives the change of the entire system. Okay. So, so where it starts, um, uh, most human beings, you know, perhaps this was quite a few people wandering around before COVID were in their comfort zone, uh, not really realizing that anything needs to change, not really realizing despite Bill Gates's video or Ted talk five years ago, warning of this exact problem. Uh, and despite, you know, e even I wrote a book about uh, some of the wicked issues we're facing, you know, whether it's climate change um, or uh, healthcare or food safety and security in the food supply system and food distribution, uh, food waste, all of that, the political system. But many people were sort of blithely going ahead in their comfort zone, not recognizing that there was any change required. And then, of course, something happens. Something happens to challenge our reality. And in this case, this eruption of this wicked issue, COVID-19. Uh, and that induces pain and suffering uh, and panic and worry and concern. And of course, the, human, the natural human response when faced with a threat is to retreat. And we've seen this in many organizations globally. They've gone into freeze mode. 
So fight, flight, or play dead is the natural response to threat. And a lot of people have just shut down, you know, uh, kind of bunker mentality to the challenge um, and really trying to stick their head in the sand and, and resist the change. Um, so what you see is often uh, when change looks pretty obvious and it has to happen, ironically, a lot of people resist the change. And in fact, some want to go backwards to how it was before. And so we're going to see a very interesting period where can we really keep moving forward into the future or are we going to try and just go back to normal, try and put this in the rear view mirror, forget like it ever happened or not. So those first three steps is kind of where we are right now. And this is really the stage of discovery. We've now discovering that something's not quite right and maybe we need to do something about it. So what, what form, you've explained a little bit, but what form does that resistance take and, and, and how strong is it, do you think? Well, it's very strong. And, and so I want to come back to the form of the resistance uh, in a little bit. I just want to give you the entire 12 steps and then come back to what form, because there are many forms of resistance. You know, some of them look like people are, you know, uh, adopting the change or adapting to the change, but actually it's just a sort of clever form of resistance. So if I may, I'll come back to that, but show you what lies ahead. So on the journey of change, uh, we're in pain at step two, and that's where many people are right now. Um, and if you're not at step two, many people are at step three resisting and trying to go backwards. Um, but hopefully, uh, if there's enough courage and enough encouragement and enough positivity and forward momentum, the resistance starts to subside. And then we get to a really critical point on the journey is we have to commit. We have to commit to doing something differently. Um, and that's a crucial moment. It's a kind of moment of truth, because if we don't make the commitment to change something, it's not enough just to think about what we may or may not do and scenario plan. This is a fundamental, you know, on the inside, in your heart, to commit to not being the same again. And this is true whether it's a change in your own personal development, a change in your business, your business model, your sort of geographic footprint, uh, you know, your products or services, you have to make a commitment for that change to sustain. So there's a moment of truth. But once you start to commit, then the planning starts. Okay, now I've made the decision. And there's no going back. Once I've made the decision to change, I've made the decision. So this is a very strong commitment, uh, where you can't go back, because it's not possible. And we'll come on to that in a moment. Um, then we start have to prepare for the change. So that's the sort of stage of decision. Uh, we've got to decide to be different before actually changing. So sometimes uh, when we've been coaching individuals or teams and we've been trying to help them develop as human beings or organisations, and it's been really difficult, uh, and we've had to ourselves, as you know, Katie, retrace our steps because we thought we'd got the commitment, but we hadn't realised, hadn't really got the commitment. So sometimes you have to retrace yourself oh my goodness, you said you wanted to change, but I've realized now in talking to you, individual team, organization, uh, whoever, uh, that the commitment wasn't quite strong enough. We mm -hmm. talked about committing, but we didn't actually commit. So you have to retrace your steps and go back to stay, step five and redo those two steps. So how, how that's do the decision you know, phase. How do you know if somebody has committed? Because I, you know, I can say lots of things. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm committed to you know, losing weight or getting fit or mm. whatever. Um, mm. How do you know that that commitment, because you talked about n not going back. It was a kind of not going back time. Well, it, it, it's a really good question. Um, so if you've committed to the change, the person should then start to be doing some of the preparatory work for that change. So you should see a different energy. You should see some sort of momentum some activity of preparing for that change. And in your conversation, uh, the person in front of you or the team or the organization should feel different. It doesn't feel like the talk of change. This is now the walk of change. So the energy is different. The uh, level uh, of commitment is different. Uh, the level of focus is different. And activity is different. People are starting now, you know, if you've committed to climb Mount Everest, People should, after the commitment, start be making preparations for the journey. It's almost like an, excite, an excitement for, for that. Well, uh, equal excitement, sometimes nervousness, because, you know, we're sort of going into the unknown here. 
is we're committing to something and we're not quite sure what lies ahead, which is why to, for change to be really effective and sustainable, you often need a guide who's done the journey before. Um, and now, of course, lots of people say they have done the journey of change and say that they can take you there, but not a lot of people really can. So there's a whole piece here is you have to find somebody that you can really trust who really has done the work because beyond the preparation, you actually get into the work and the work of change. And by that, I don't mean just changing a few skills or changing how much you know. I, I mean the real work and the real work is actually you improve or you not improve, you uh, develop to a new level of capability. Uh, and whether that's, uh, you know, a, a greater level of mat ego maturity, uh, you evolve the culture, uh, you, you know, you develop what the organization's capable of. There's actual work here. It's not just sort of a bit of learning. You know, we're a bit more knowledgeable. We're a bit more experienced. You know, it, it actually feels different. And we've done the work and the work has actually bitten and the work works. So that's an awful lot. And some people might be in that doing the work for years and years, the work of change. It's a big thing. Um, and even when you've done the work, sometimes uh, you have to ask yourself, well, why did we need to do this work in the first place? And there's, even when you've done the work, sometimes you get a sense of it, it's not quite enough. And that's because there's deep work uh, in leadership terms. This is called the shadow work. Um, but sometimes people will do the work and skip over the deep work. Um, and once you've done the work and hopefully the deep work, then the, the journey becomes about stabilizing, embodying, not just having done the work of change. Once you've done the work of change and particularly the deep work of change, you know you're different. I mean, as a human being and as a team, you know, individually you can feel it and the team can feel it. There's something different about us. And we talked in last week's webinar about emotional regulation as an example of, you know, are we going to end up in PTSD or post-traumatic growth? And that's the work uh, at step seven uh, to try and get into the turning uh, a threat into an opportunity. We do the emotional regulation work uh, and that's the work. But the deep work was finding meaning, finding meaning in the crisis. So if we do the work, emotional regulation and the deep work, we can turn crisis or threat into an opportunity. But then you're on to step nine, which is how do we now embody this new way of being? Uh, that's the sort of consolidation phase. So those are the three steps really that you need to develop. The work, the deep work and the embodiment. Um, and there's a lovely metaphor here of the deep work. It's called the innermost cave. Uh, and that's where the treasure really lies, is you've got to be prepared to really face the fears uh, that you're avoiding. Uh, but it's also... That treasure uh, is where the healing uh, and the permanence also lies. So if you do the work and the deep work, and you can truly embody that, you've really developed. You've changed things and there's no going back. It's a question about um, being COVID specific here. What, what's the, the specific elements um, that are coming up uh, in relation to COVID-19? Well, I, I mean, hopefully, as we've talked about on some of these webinars and podcasts, is uh, people are aware now that, that they, they worry a lot. Um, you know, they're flipped out by the, the news or, or social media. Uh, they feel panicky. They feel concerned about their children's future. Uh, they're concerned about some of their elderly relatives or people that they know. And so what comes into focus is, I just feel terrible every day. I, I feel worried. And so if they are in that sort of that sort of fear of step two um, and they don't go into resistance um, and they keep pushing forward, they might start to commit to how do I not feel terrible every day? I need to change something about myself. So they've got to crest the, cross the threshold. If they don't make a commitment to being different, I don't want to be anxious every day. And I've got to commit to discovering how not to be anxious every day. Um, then I will cross the threshold at step five and I'll start to look for resources, the preparation for the work, that can help me. Books, coaches, guides, mentors, uh, people like that. And they'll help me do the work, which is starting to look at how I regulate my emotions in the face of a pandemic like COVID or 
or whatever the challenge is. Um, and again, that's the work. And then the deep work is finding the meaning in the crisis and then the embodiment. So these steps apply whether we're talking to COVID, whether we're talking about our leadership development, uh, the development of our team, the development of our organization, the same steps still apply. These are the 12 steps that you have to go through in the journey of change. So where do we go from, from embodying? Um, presumably that, that's developed. And this is, you're talking here about individuals and also um, organizations as well. Right. So organizations talk an enormous amount about change and transformational change. And there's this lovely phrase that, you know, transformation is a word worn smooth by a million tongues. Like a lot of people talk about that, oh, it's transformational change. But most of it really isn't because they haven't really done the work. They've had experiences. And just because you've had an experience doesn't mean you've changed. And just because you've acquired more knowledge doesn't mean you've changed. I mean, I, again, I may have told this story before, but I, it brings it into sharp focus. I was talking to the uh, CFO uh, of a big, uh, one of the big five audit companies who wanted some help. Uh, with an, an executive and they said well look we don't know what to do with this this lady because uh, we're not sure whether to promote her or sack her and I said oh well, that's very interesting why do you say that and she said well she's bringing you know hundreds of millions of pounds into our London office biggest fee earner but we've got five grievance procedures around her and I said oh don't tell me Margaret you've given her a coach she said I did give her a coach I said the coach has taught her some skills the coach has taught her some skills I said it's just made her a more effective bully that's what's happened so just because you've learned some skills or you've acquired some knowledge doesn't mean you've changed, doesn't mean you've developed. It just means you can become a more effective bully. And the kind of change we're talking about is a fundamental shift in who you are as a human being. It's what's called in the trade adult development. So when you develop up to the next level, the bully disappears because you're wise enough to realize the error of that. Uh, whereas if you just acquire a few skills, you've had a bit of an experience, you've gone on some advanced leadership course and had a bit of a, uh, you know, luminaries have flown in and given you their wisdom from the West Coast or from Silicon Valley. We may have acquired knowledge. We might have learned a few tricks, but we're still basically the same person. There hasn't really been any change. So uh, change is really a euphemism for develop. I mean, you could use the two words sort of interchangeably. Um, if you really develop, you know you've developed. And there's no going back, Katie. Um, and How do you know you've developed, Alan? Just, just you, can, you can feel it. You, you're just not the same person. I'm not the person I was. I was having a, a conversation uh, uh, with a, a, a female executive recently, and she was relating a story about um, a guy that she used to date. And eventually she just got fed up with the sort of dynamic that was going on. Um, and she was listening one day to the stuff that he was always saying to her and she suddenly realized it, it wasn't touching her anymore, that something inside her had changed. I, all the stories and all the narratives and all the nonsense uh, that she used to be sort of upset by, it was just water off a duck's back now. She changed, that something inside her had switched. And so, um, and she maybe done some work, maybe she'd even done some deep work, but she was now embodying it. She was fundamentally different and she could feel it. So if, you, if you're not sure whether you've really done the work, the answer is you probably haven't. You can absolutely feel the difference. You know it for yourself. You are different. You can feel you're different. And sometimes the people around you can see that you're different. And of course, then you return to your life as it was, um, and you can deliver at a whole new level. And if you deliver at a whole new level, it might inspire you or those around you to go on another cycle. So these are really the 12 steps of change. And what's interesting, the four critical moments is a sort of interesting geometry here is the first phase uh, is really about waking up. I've got some data that humanity isn't proceeding in the right way. You know, we keep having these wicked problems and these zoonotropic diseases, you know, viruses keep jumping from birds and bats and monkeys into man. Something's not right. We've woken up. We've realized that people are lying to people are lying to us. We've woken up to something. Um, and so that critical moment is we are now awake and we weren't really awake, which is why when I was doctoring, paradoxically, people would often say to me things that were really sort of uh, strange. You know, that cancer diagnosis, 
was the best thing that ever happened to me. That heart attack was the best thing that ever, which is a really strange thing to say. But what they were really saying is it made me wake up. I suddenly realized that the way I was running my life was all wrong. And that's a critical moment on the journey, that awakening to a a, a deeper truth. And once we awaken, we basically discovered, we have this lovely visual image of somebody suddenly looking shocked, that sort of aha moment, the penny has dropped. I've discovered something fundamentally important about myself, about my family, my team, my organization, those around me that I hadn't spotted before. I've woken up to a fundamental truth. Um, and then and this, that, this waking up, Alan, does it, does, do you have to go through a difficult period in your life in order to wake up? It's a great question. The, the simple answer to that is no. Uh, but unfortunately, most people, yes. So most people, if you're in your comfort zone, there's no need to wake up. Everything's good. Everything's fine. You know, I'm quite happy here in the nice warm water. Um, and so unfortunately, it takes pain to wake people up to the reality of what's going on. I don't think humanity has reached a level of sophistication or wisdom where we can spot. Uh, I mean, you, there's been a lot of debate in the media, for example. Why didn't we do more in January and February? We knew this wave was coming. Well, maybe we just weren't awake enough to, you know, the, the possibilities and the realities. You know, we didn't order enough tests. We didn't order enough PPE uh, far enough in advance. Um, and of course, one of the big things is, will we be sufficiently awake for the next crisis? I mean, that's a, that's a big question. And so part of the reason for sharing these steps is to show you the cycle, you know, all the 12 steps you need to do to make sure you're permanently awake and alive to what's really going on. Okay, I'm going to let you go through those next ones. I've got a couple of questions. Yeah. So when you've, when you've been through those. So once you've woken up, of course, the next stage is to own up, to own up to the fact that you need to be different um, and you need to commit to changing. And so the, the photo we sort of show people on this is a, a, a guy or a girl jumping off the side of a mountain in a squirrel suit. And that's the sort of level of commitment we're talking about. Because once you've jumped off the mountain, there ain't no going back. You know, a lot of people say, yes, they've committed to change, but all they've really done is jump up and down and still stay, stay on the mountain. They haven't actually jumped off the mountain. So if you jump off the mountain in a squirrel suit, you cannot jump back on the mountain. So that's the sort of commitment we're talking about. A commitment required where you can't go back once you've made that commitment. There is no going back. There's only going forward. So once you've decided, you've owned up to the fact that there has to be some change, and that change has to happen with me, Uh, not with them. A lot of people burn an awful lot of time and energy trying to get others to change, not realizing actually the change. The only change you can really drive is the change in yourself. If you want to make your life better, you can't. It's very difficult to improve your life by trying to change others. So start with yourself. That's something you can change, you know, change how you think, how you feel and what you do. Right. So it's right here with us. That's where the change and that's the commitment. So once you've committed to change, then you get into the work of development, which is really about growing up as a human being. Now, most adults, when they reach 18, think they're fully grown. But if you look at the academic literature and there's a really rich and beautiful literature on adult development. So many of us are aware of stages of child development, but many people are not aware that there are just as very clear cut stages of adult development. Just because you're 18 doesn't mean you're fully grown. You're not grown up. Uh, And that's very clear in many organizations. I mean, most human beings have experienced bullying and tantrums in organizations, frankly, behavior that's more uh, suitable for a playground in school. And so why does that happen? Well, it's because you know, leaders or uh, executives or individuals in companies may be 30, 40, 50, 60 on the outside, but on the inside, they're often still 14. So there hasn't been this growing up. There's an, a chronological aging, but not necessarily a maturation. So there's a growing up there, and that's where the breakthrough really occurs. So when people talk about breakthrough, breakthrough is really about you move up a level and where things come online that didn't even make sense at the previous level. That's the real breakthrough. That's the real transformation, not the sort of quasi transformation that people talk about. Uh, It's a real breakthrough, a real transformation. So it's sort of metaphor of us growing up, we become what's called vertically developed. Um, And then ultimately, the last uh, uh, is when you deliver that transformation in the world. So as you become more mature, 
you can deliver the transformation uh, out there in the world. So those are really the four turning points in the geometry of change. Uh, okay. And I'm quite happy to come back to the resistance piece because I think that's what holds people back. Okay, um, just one question. Are you optimistic that leaders globally will, act, will actually change from this COVID crisis? Or do you see a repeat of the 2008 crisis where not much was Very good left? question. Very good question. And um, I think it's in the balance. And that's why I'm trying to get the, you know, if you don't understand what it takes to change yourself, and by the way, most people don't, then the chances of accidentally successfully navigating all these 12 steps are small. So human beings have got form for not changing much. Uh, I mean, I think actually we will change, but I think the real question is not whether we will or we won't. It's a question of how much will we change and how quickly will we change? Because the clock's ticking. These wicked problems are mounting. Affordable health care, criminal justice, a broken political system, uh, an educational system. And again, we'll come on to what needs to change in a moment. But... Um, we need to understand the steps of change, which is why we're having this particular webinar, in order to navigate that. So if people have a desire, many people do, by the way, I want to change the world. You know, people feel a very strong desire to make a difference, but then struggle to know, well, why is it so hard? I, I feel a compulsion, want to do something positive and contributory, but it's incredibly difficult. And one of the reasons it's incredibly difficult is even before we get to the wake-up call, uh, there's often resistance. So you see this in, in organizations all the time. And the sort of two classic examples of, you know, pre-challenge resistance when I'm in comfort zone is, is ignorance and arrogance. You know, and you'll see people, you know, not even realizing that something's wrong. It's a kind of the ignorance position. Or I realize there's something wrong, but I don't need to do anything about it. You know, I've got this covered. So even before you get to the data, uh, there's often some ignorance and arrogance. But most of the resistance occurs in step three. And again, the two most common forms of resistance is I realize something's wrong, but I don't need help. You know, I'm fine. And, and as you know, we keep a list of all the CEOs we've uh, suggested needed to change and they've refused. They, you know, we don't need help. We're fine. Everything's fine. And then within a year, they've been sacked. So I used to see this when I was doctoring um, is that human beings, when they come in with a heart attack, uh, often believed everything was fine. Um, and it's, it's often said that the the first sign of heart disease in 60% of men is death. So the crisis hits and people didn't see it coming. You know, and it's this sort of either if they notice something's wrong, they don't need help. So it's very typical. It's called refusal of the call. The call uh, to something other, uh, to a different future. And many people refuse because they're scared uh, that something, I don't know what, it's uncertainty, this change is future. So they refuse help. They refuse the call. Um, or they simply think they know better. They're very opinionated. They think they know, oh, yeah, that's not true. I don't need to listen to you. Who are you? You don't know what you're talking about. So they're the classic biggest forms of resistance. But there are, you know, 12 other examples of the dog ate my homework, what I call the dirty dozen, 12 reasons why people don't change. Uh, so in COVID, for example, well, we don't need to change. The government hasn't said we need to change. The government's not said. And if it was really important to change, or do, the government would have told me so. So some people use the boss, you know, the company, the government as an excuse not to do anything. Um, or even worse, the government has said you've got to socially distance. And there was that classic example of, you know, the lads in the Midlands uh, still doing a barbecue when the government's told everybody to socially distance. Well, yes, they have said something. We're just ignoring them because what do they know? So, again, a reason for resi of resistance. Um, and you'll also see in, in COVID... Uh, well, you know, people said that they, we need to do this, but it isn't really that necessary. So we'll just sort of wait it out and wait and see. Again, another form of resistance. Um, some organizations say we, we can't afford the change. Well, you know, it makes you wonder, can they afford not to change? So another reason for, for resisting is you can't afford it. Or it's too risky. Reason number five, it's too risky to do that. Or oh, that's too drastic. That's too drastic a change that you're suggesting. Um, or we can't change that quickly, so therefore we won't even try. Um, we'd like to change, but we haven't really got the capability, reason number eight. Um, well, it wouldn't work even if we tried that, reason number nine. It's not even my problem, reason number ten. Uh, little old me, well, what can I do? I can't change the world. Somebody else has to, reason number 11. Um, and what I call ultimately reason number 12, uh, BSE mentality. Blame somebody else, right? 
well, you know, even if I wanted to, it, uh, there's no point because the shareholders wouldn't go for it. So let's blame the government. Let's blame somebody else other than myself. So there are lots of reasons uh, people resist change. But I really encourage, but it's not as hard as you think. And, you know, the next generation are looking at us. And there's this lovely photo of this girl staring at. And this is kind of uh, the point that Greta Thunberg made is, uh, you know, what we do now in these next 10 years is not just for us, it's for future generations. What we learn as a result of COVID is for future generations. How much will we change, Katie? How much will we embrace change? You know, and what exactly do we need to change? So my view is, you know, change any of it. I mean, change something. So I want to just hold out a sort of branch of optimism here for people. You know, what would the world be like if we changed, if we created a new political model and framework where wise leaders, not popular leaders, you know, politics has been a kind of popularity contest and a personality contest. What about if we had wise leaders in charge? The world would be very different. What about a new model of capitalism? There's been an awful lot of talk uh, in the last five or 10 years about triple bottom lining, conscious capitalism, and so on. Uh, and I think most observers, even some of the hard bitten capitalists are realizing there's something profoundly wrong with capitalism. But what, what if we created a new model that didn't drive so much inequity, which makes the richer richer and the poorer poorer? What if we had a new model of capitalism? Why, wouldn't, why shouldn't we change that? What about food security, which is directly related to this COVID uh, crisis? And food waste, we waste 30 to 40% of all food produced. And food distribution, there's, you know, 2 billion people starving in the world. Why don't we change that? Why don't we change the climate, you know, and actually start to reverse? And we've seen through COVID, you know, everybody's seen the photographs of, you know, parts of the world where, you know, um, smog has dropped dramatically because we've stayed indoors. So we can do it. We can affect change if we're committed enough to that change. Or change the global supply chains. I mean, it's very fragile. The global supply chains are very fragile. And COVID has revealed that very clearly. What about actually changing the global health system? And people are beginning to realize that the data reported, and the UK is now the third worst for death rates, but there's such a wide variety in the reporting processes so no health system in the world is reporting in the same way. That's a ridiculous thing. We should have much greater levels of collaboration. Why don't we change that? Why don't we change criminal justice? Why don't we change our educational systems for the better? You know, and if we've got a society where people got rich out of helping each other rather than helping ourselves, the society would be a very different thing. So there are many, many things that we could change. Uh, and the good news about it is it just takes a single step. So that's all I would encourage people is just start doing the work of change. Just start taking a step. All journeys, it's the adage of a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. All of us can take a single step and start to create the momentum for change. One of the questions is, is what do you think, um, what do you think will change? Well, um, I think some of the uh, change in uh, consumer, uh, consumer behavior, consumption, uh, that will probably take two or three years. Um, and some of the smart companies are, are already anticipating that and starting to set up their factories differently. People will buy different things. Um, you know, probably cleaning products will, will go up. Uh, people will possibly, uh, you know, they've had to learn to cook at home a bit more. So not everybody in the world is taking, getting takeout every night. Um, they're actually having to learn to cook and, and starting to realize, well, maybe they can. And so maybe people preparing food at home will change. So our behavior in the home will change. So either little things like that, or what I really hope is enough people who feel passionate enough, who recognize that there's some big issues that need to change. Because if every single person just focuses on themselves and their family, then on a macro scale, not much will be different. We'll be in the 2008, you know, where people talked about it a lot, but at the end of the day, not much really changed. So we need people to sort of step forward and actually start leading change and driving change uh, and being enthusiastic about change because we can change for the better. Change isn't a dirty word. I mean, it's ironic. You know, I think sometimes we're, we, we, you know, we're brought up as children to see change as a negative. But actually, if we change for the better, it's an unbelievable positive. 
So until we start having narratives that change is a good thing, you know, actually it's about evolution. It's about improvement. It's about development uh, and healthy change. Um, so let's get into that. And let's get really good as leaders at driving and leading change for the better. Then we'd be in a very different place. There's a question just, just riffing off that. Basically, you're implying that the change that the government is driving to solve COVID is the right way to go. What if I believe they've got the strategy wrong more than once? That mm. makes me a wicked resistor, right? That's a prescription for an authoritarian state. No, I, I, I'm not saying the government has got the strategy right. I don't know why. <laughs> if somebody's taken that away from what I'm saying, that's absolutely not what I'm saying. I'm saying that there's been a lot of mistakes. I mean, today was when we were meant to get to 100,000 tests a day in the UK. Uh, you know, and if you believe the stats, we're at 53,000. You know, uh, and so but what you get from politicians is nobody stands up and says, we got that completely wrong. I was wrong about that. Um, you know, we, it's all about the narrative in politics rather than about the change. You know, so we need a much greater level of honesty. And so if we disagree, step forward, be vocal about your disagreement, but also do some, you know, some work, you know, so have some meat on the bones behind your argument and try and affect change. Um, and as you know, Katie, you know, I'm writing books all the time about change, about how we drive change and politically and, and particularly change in the political system. So one of the books I wrote, Crowdocracy, was talking about democracy. And so not only is capitalism passed at sell by date, so is democracy. And there's a, a massive amount of evidence globally for that fact. The democracy has been brilliant for humanity for three or four hundred years, but it's now uh, insufficiently subtle and nuanced to deal with the level of complexity we're facing. So we need a new system. There are three systems that have already emerged that have gone beyond democracy. It's just not many people know about it. So if you want to drive change, you know, knowledge up about what it takes and what you can do, simple things, you know, basic steps that can really make a profound difference, small steps with a big difference. We're not helpless in this. And that's the good news here is we really, yeah. none of us are helpless in this, but it requires us to commit, to knowledge up, to prepare and start developing ourselves, each other and the planet. This question here, Alan, about change management for organisations. We used to associate the resistance to a, a lost people um, and they're afraid to lose something. Will that apply here with COVID? What can people feel they are losing? Well, um, anything. I mean, people... Uh, the, the primary obstacle to change is fear. We're, we're scared of something. We're scared of a loss. We're scared of the change itself. You know, but you have to let go of things in order to grab the new thing. Um, so again, we've got to be comfortable with that change. Um, and it's really a perspective. Have we lost it or have we let it go? I mean, it's a very different thing. Mm. You know, are we trapped at home or are we safe at home? It's kind of just the way that you see it. Um, so you could say, you know, we haven't really lost it. When we lose somebody, you know, we still got the memory of them, right? Uh, and I, you know, as a doctor, you know, I've been up close and personal with death on hundreds and hundreds of occasions, you know, and I've lost close relatives, but I still have the love and the memory of those close relatives. Of course, it's sad that you can't see them again, but, you know, you, uh, you could say, well, you've lost that person from your life, uh, which is true, you know, on a literal sense. But what I do have, uh, you know, of my sister, uh, who I was extremely close to, I lost a few years ago, is I have the love and the memory of my sister, you know, and I always, always have that. And so, you know, loss is part of life. It, it's part of the process. And so we need to, uh, you know, develop a more mature stance than good, bad, you know, in terms of loss and non-loss. I want to ask you a couple of questions about um, the model. Somebody saying, I like the model. Is it yours, Alan? Have you written this up somewhere? It, this is the book that comes out next year. Um, I'm, as you know, Katie, I'm writing three books simultaneously at the moment. Yeah, and why you uh, can't write a few more? I don't know, or a bit quicker. <laughs> Not good yes. enough. Um, uh, so this is called Step Change. So this book will be out next year where we'll give you chapter and verse uh, and it's really the allegory of our life, really. It's all of our journeys. I mean, these are the 12 steps of change. Um, and so it's based on one of my great heroes, as you know, is a chap called Joseph Campbell, who was a professor of comparative religion uh, uh, and a world expert on culture. 
Um, and uh, he was actually the guy that inspired George Lucas to, to write and make Star Wars. A brilliant, brilliant guy, Joseph Campbell. In fact, one of my four sons is named Joseph after Joseph Campbell. So Joseph Campbell wrote about the hero's journey. Uh, and these are really, it's an adaptation of that, but applied in the modern world. What are the steps that we all have to go through to uh, create change, deliver change and sustain change? And these are the 12 steps. So this is going to be chapter and verse uh, in the book Step Change when it comes out next year. Another question, how do you think that coaching and team development will change? Well, I think um, we talked about this before, uh, that there's this concept in America called DDOs, Deliberately Developmental Organisations. I think coaching uh, and teamwork has to be focused on not this sort of horizontal change, which is the acquisition of skills, knowledge and experience, or what most people would call learning, but vertical change, vertical development. So learning is a horizontal process. Development is a vertical process. They're completely different vectors. L is not D. Now, you have to learn things in order to develop. But 20% of the value is in the learning. 80% of the value is in the development. So if you acquire some knowledge, you've got to deploy that knowledge to make yourself different. So I might learn, for example, about emotional intelligence, but if I then don't deploy those skills in my life, I've not developed the emotional intelligence that I have the intellectual comprehension of. So I've got what you call aboutism. I know about emotional intelligence, but I'm not very emotionally intelligent myself. You know, so where it falls down is people are obsessed and have been for some time with learning organizations. And, you know, you go up the learning curves and school and education is all about learning. Whereas what it should be about is development. We've got to start privilege. So my hope for coaching and teamwork is the focus becomes development. And I mean vertical development, not horizontal change, where when you move up a level, things come online that didn't even make sense at the previous level. You are fundamentally different. Alan, can you just take that slide down so we can just see you a bit a bit larger? I've just got um, one more question. Um, picking up the um, above point, we need to recognise the value in resistance and engage with it. Those trying to drive forward with their view of the answer might simply dismiss the resistors. How do we ensure that neither side tries to ignore or shut each other down? For it's example, brilliant, valid brilliant questions question. about the man-made climate narrative are dismissed as denial. Yeah, it's a, it's a brilliant question, right? Is, uh, it needs a bit of wisdom, right? Is uh, to, to tease out, sometimes there's real wisdom in resistance. You know, is the resistance pointing to something that we've overlooked, for example? So we need to work with the resistance, not steamroller across it. We need to understand the nature of that resistance. Uh, and so sometimes, we see this, you and I, all the time when we work with teams, is it's the resistor or the person driving the conflict in the room that spotted something that none of the other 12 team members have spotted. So rather than steamroller across it or marginalize that person, we've got to understand what's behind that concern, what's behind that tension, and is there an absolute pearl or jewel to be had there, and to try and integrate that view. So not dismiss it, marginalize it, or steamroller off, uh, over it, so working with the resistance to understand if there is indeed some wisdom in it. And there isn't always. I mean, sometimes people just nay say to be devil's advocate or just to be contrary um, or just simply out of ego immaturity. You know, I don't like that idea simply because I didn't think of it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's not really legitimate resistance. Uh, you know, so if you can try and mine out the nature of that, you know, is there some real wisdom behind that resistance? Then it can really add to the value of the answer. Um, but it's making that discernment. Is there wisdom in it or is it just resistance? Okay. And um, in context, of the example of the coaching example you gave, uh, the employee who didn't change their bullying behaviour, could you please explain how step 10, 11 and 12 could look like as success? Well, if they, um, well, in that person, there was no success because they'd returned, they hadn't changed, they returned the same person, just a bit more knowledgeable. But if you actually move up a level of development, um, uh, and you start to see that actually, whilst you can bully your way to a short term success, in the long run, you'll everybody will f move away from you. So you'll have no influence in the world. So ultimately, it's counterproductive. Uh, and if you move up a level uh, of maturity, 
you start to realize things like that and thinking, mm, yeah, actually, I might better bullet my way to an answer in the short term, but in the medium to long term, actually, this is going to be significantly negative. So I need to show up in a different way. I need to mature and uh, uh, be a different kind of person. And so when I return to the world uh, in step 10, uh, that new person, the person that realizes, you know, truth and reconciliation, realizes I was bullying people, you know, can apologize and admit uh, I was wrong, which is a sign of great maturity, then I can possibly deliver results for a much longer, that's step 11. And in that change, as I change myself, uh, I send out a signal that it is possible to change. So that's the thing for leaders, is if leaders change themselves, because most people, by the way, don't change much and don't realize that change is that, that easy or that possible. But if I can change myself, uh, then I send out a very clear signal that change is possible and necessary. Thanks, Alan. Um, some real, some, some big thank yous um, coming in from people. One sort of um, thanks a lot for the input and thoughts, deep work uh, and understanding is just a gift for the world. So um, thank you for today's session and thank you all for, for joining with us and, and, and staying with us. Next week, we're going to be looking at uh, truth, trust and transparency. Uh, in a crisis, accurate information is essential but who do we trust to provide it? So same time, same place um, to say thank you for staying with us. Hope uh, the session has worked really well for you today and we'll see you next week. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. Bye-bye.